Welcome to our War Within Feral Druid starter video. Whether you're a veteran player eager to get ahead in the new expansion, or you're just curious about the latest changes for Feral Druids, this video is going to be for you. We're going to cover everything that you need to hit the ground running, including a look at what's new for Druids in the War Within, the top talent choices, the best gear loadouts, the most optimal races, and as a bonus, we're also going to be including some essential macros that you will not want to be without. And if you are ready to dominate in the War Within, our brand new update to the skill capped add-on has just dropped, giving skill capped members the best UI for PvP with just one click. We've partnered with the world's best players to ensure the skill capped UI is ready for every class in the War Within and to bring you exclusive guides that unlock the full potential of your class. From maximizing damage to perfecting crowd control and outsmarting opponents with the latest tech, we've got you covered. While everyone else is just confused, you can instantly get ahead of the curve with our guides, which are designed to fast track your progress and put you miles ahead of the competition. We're even so confident in our service that we guarantee you'll gain at least 400 rating or you're gonna get your money back. So why wait? Click the link in the description below now and join SkillCap today. So to kick things off, Ferals have received some major playstyle changes in the War Within that make dishing out pressure way more fluid, similar to kind of how it used to be back in the older versions of the game. In Dragonflight, the wild attunement PvP talent forced you to spam Cyclones in order to create some massive pressure from Feral Frenzy to which put a sour taste in players' mouths when this became their go-to in order to maximize their burst windows, especially with it being the number one reason why this spec had the highest death rate in Solo Shuffle. Well, thankfully, long gone are the days where this meant everything to your rotation, as you're now rewarded by playing in cat form to actually deal damage instead of outside of it. Now, you're going to be more methodical on when you choose to cast Cyclone, as you're not really likely to use this unless you can guarantee that you're going to land it, or if you need to get kicks out of the way for your teammates to freely cast in order to recover or deal damage. Another key change is that we receive a bit more defensive utility located in our Druid Tree as we obtain a new talent called Oak Skin that increases the effectiveness on our primary defensive abilities, Survival Instincts, and Bark Skin by 10%, greatly assisting us as we've been constantly prone to getting trained from how squishy our spec really is. And from our newly revamped talent trees, we can now pick up Cyclone, Astral Influence, and Renewal a bit easier as we progress down the Druid Tree giving us a bit more room to pick up other talents that weren't as accessible. We also have received a new addition to our PvP talents, Tireless Pursuit, which used to be available in our Druid Tree in Dragonflight, greatly helping us with our mobility creep whenever we choose to shift out of form. So, while the standard Druid and Feral talent trees have undergone some slight change, the main focal point of the War Within and where most of the new stuff really comes from is from the introduction of what's called Hero Talents, with every class having two Hero Talent trees to choose from. For Feral Druids, this is Druid of the Claw and Wildstalker. Starting off, we have Wildstalker, which is currently our preferred pickup, granting us our centerpiece node of Thriving Growth. Thriving Growth offers a pretty nice balance of more bleed damage and more healing, granting us more spells that we can apply on targets. For bleed damage, we have a chance to apply Bloodseeker Vines on a target affected by Rip or Rake whenever these deal damage. Now on the flip side, we can apply Symbiotic Blooms on friendly targets that are affected by your heals coming out of regrowth. Most of the talents we receive in this hero tree revolve around our centerpiece node, giving us more of an incentive to apply Bloodseeker Vines on multiple targets to retrieve more overall damage, while also buffing your direct single target damage coming out of Ferocious Bite on your selected target if it is active. 
Now, because of these incentives, we become conditioned to cleave more often. And by doing this, we open up potential kill windows on targets we aren't focusing down. Now, on the other hand, Jorda the Claw introduces a powerful new ability called Ravage, which replaces Ferocious Bite. Ravage now enhances your Ferocious Bite damage, while also adding some AoE cleave to nearby targets you are in front of. Ultimately, with how the meta currently stands right now, Wildstalker is our preferred hero build out of the two, giving us more consistency in how we can deal bleed damage while occasionally amplifying our ferocious bites with bursting growth. This decision is primarily due to how many nerfs Druid of the Claw has been hit with, mainly with Saber Jaws, which received absolutely massive nerfs to how much damage we can produce from ferocious bite. But if Druid of the Claw receives some buffs later down the road, well, we expect this to be a promising pick for players that want more single target burst that put your opponents on edge. But now that we have a basic understanding of what these trees offer, it's time to delve a little bit deeper and discuss how to best allocate our new hero talent points. As for Wildstalker, on the left side of the tree, you're gonna be met with Hunt Beneath the Open Skies which provides you with a passive buff to both healing and damage while cat form is active, slightly rewarding you for using your instant cast regrowths with predatory swiftness. Now, not to mention, we also receive a 10% damage buff to Moonfire and Sunfire, and is a great addition when Lunar Inspiration is picked for single target burst. Down below, we have Lethal Preservation, granting you a combo point and a minor heal to yourself or on your allies if you are at full health when we remove an effect with either Soothe or Remove Corruption. And in most cases, we're going to benefit out of Remove Corruption since we rarely pick up Soothe in our Clash Tree. Then we're met with a choice, Resilient Flourishing or Root Network. Both of these talents tend to be viable depending on how you plan to deal damage. If you're focusing more on single target, Resilient Flourishing is our recommended pick, as it's mainly used to extend the duration on both Bloodseeker Vines and Symbiotic Blooms. Now, in case you plan to spread out your bleeds on multiple targets, do look to grab Root Network instead to increase our damage by 2% per Bloodseeker Vine active. Going down the middle now, we have Strategic Infusion, giving us a nice crit bonus on our Shred, Rake, and Brutal Slash for a short duration after using Tiger's Fury or opening on a target out of stealth. This also increases the crit chance a bit to our hots when we throw out some regrowths on ourselves or our allies. Now we have more of a flexible pick between Entangling Vortex and Flower Walk. Flower Walk is our suggested pick in most cases here, as you become more mobile when Barkskin is active and spawn flowers beneath your feet every second for some minor AoE healing. However, you might find that Entangling Vortex can be quite useful at times where you need more uptime on your target or when you're struggling to avoid damage, especially against melee cleaves. And if you do select Entangling Vortex, this makes Ursal's Vortex our only pick in this circumstance, so do make sure to swap out Mass Entanglement for this talent in its respective choice node. Moving down, we have Bursting Growth, incorporating a bit more splash damage to nearby targets when Bloodseeker Vines expires or when Ferocious Bite is used on a target affected by it. This also applies the same way to our Symbiotic Blooms for a minor boost to our AoE healing, but instead of proccing its heal from Ferocious Bite, we use Rejuvenation instead. Moving over to the right side of the tree, we have Wildstalker's Power for some nice buffs to rip, Ferocious Bite, and Rejuvenation. Alongside this, we have our second-to-last choice node, Bond with Nature, and Harmonious Constitution. With the latter only buffing our regrowth healing on ourselves, it's uncommon that we use our instant cast regrowths unless we're under massive pressure. And with us being so reliant on healers, why wouldn't you want to pick up Bond with Nature to help your healer to recover you a little bit easier? But if you end up dueling or playing double DPS 2v2, you might find that Harmonious Constitution serves a little bit better of a purpose as long as you're the only one who can heal. Now, for our last choice node, we have Twin Sprouts and Implant. 
Although Twin Sprouts does seem great for our AoE build, it tends to be like super RNG to proc, especially on the right targets. Not to mention the range on Twin Sprouts is way too small, meaning you won't really gain value out of this unless your opponents are always just stacking up on each other. And to deviate away from RNG gameplay, Implant gives us exactly what we want, a way to always apply Bloodseeker Vines on the right target. This comes from your next melee ability after Tiger's Fury is used or when it expires. And finally, we have our capstone node, Vigorous Creepers, increasing your damage to targets affected by Bloodseeker Vine and your healing on allies affected by Symbiotic Blooms. This, by itself, greatly impacts the damage we can deal from our bleed effects, especially if we snapshot our bleeds to always receive this 5% buff, even if it expires on the affected target. And if you aren't too aware of snapshotting, to keep it brief, our damage over time effects stay affected by any modifier we had the moment that spell was used, meaning that the damage it deals is going to remain the same even if all of those buffs have already expired. So, expect Feral Druid damage to be a bit more of a handful, offering us a bit more optimization than we're typically used to. All right, with the new additions covered, let's quickly go over what we're currently suggesting for your Feral and Druid talent trees. With what's on the screen now being our suggested setup for Wildstalker. Now, briefly touching on the highlights here, over on the Druid side of the tree, we have a variety of defensive talents that greatly boost our survivability. Starting off, we have Thick Hide for a nice passive damage reduction at all times, Ursine Vigor to increase our health and armor by 15% for a short duration after shifting into bear form, our new talent, Oak Skin, and as previously mentioned, this makes our primary defensive cooldowns way more impactful in terms of how much damage is reduced. Renewal as an on-demand heal and is typically used in dire situations to avoid being in execute range. And well-honed instincts to help us stabilize with frenzied regeneration once our health reaches low enough. We also have some talents you won't want to be without, such as Heart of the Wild, which is more versatile in nature as it empowers abilities that aren't really specific to Feral itself. This serves its purpose mainly to reduce our Cyclone cast time, making ourselves a little bit tankier in bear form, and to buff our healing spells as well. And then we have Mighty Bash in combination with Mane as primary stun effects, and if used together, we can reliably cross CC and potentially chain it with Cyclone on healers to get the pressure rolling. Now, on the Feral side, we have a slight amount of change with what's on the screen now being our default single target build for Wildstalker. Now, as a whole, some of the major highlights here are tireless energy, making sure we don't feel energy starved, predatory swiftness, and has been previously mentioned in this guide, to instantly cast either regrowth or entangling roots for free regardless of what form you're currently in. Now with this talent specifically, you're going to be using this mainly on entangling roots to further control your opponents, and blood talents, which is super potent to our overall bleed damage when this buff is consumed as this relies on you using three unique combo point generating abilities within four seconds to buff our next three rips or ferocious bites by an additional 25%. For information on talent swaps and any alternative builds, do check out our free article site, which is linked below. The final step in setting up our talent loadout is discussing PvP talents. Regardless of what build you play as though, we have one talent you will almost never change out of, and that is Wicked Claws. This is essential if you don't have a Mortal Strike tied to your composition, as your Infected Wounds applies a healing reduction on the target up to 20% and can be also applied with Rip. As for our second PvP talent, one that highly aligns with our single target build is Ferocious Wound. This reduces the target's maximum health up to 6% after using max combo point Ferocious Bites, and you can only apply this to one player at a time. But don't let this sway you from making good swaps to different targets, though. If you decide to play our suggested AoE build, 
we recommend exchanging Ferocious Wound for King of the Jungle, increasing our speed and healing taken by up to 20%, depending on how many rips we have active. We're then left with one extra slot, with those choices being based on the matchup at hand. Tireless Pursuit is your soft lock pick for this slot, as it provides you with more breathing room while kiting or to increase your overall uptime on players. Savage Momentum is excellent against caster comps or against a caster that's always bound to cast, reducing the cooldown on a few core spells by 10 seconds after successfully landing a kick. Strength of the Wild is a great utility spell, as you'll mainly gain use out of this to increase your health by 15% when attacked in bear form or to buff your regrowth healing, as the first cast was a higher chance crit while the rest have a way quicker cast time for a short duration. To which you'll commonly use this against setup comps to throw out some off healing on your allies during your enemy's burst windows, or to buy you enough time in bear form to where your healer can swoop in and help stabilize your HP. Lastly, we have high winds, and instead of this applying a healing and damage reduction on the affected target, we can increase the range on our utility spells mainly for Cyclone. You can also exchange Wicked Claws if you already have a Mortal Strike class on your team for any of these potential PvP talents, depending on what makes the most sense. All right, now that we understand the optimal talent choices and the reasoning behind them all, the next goal is setting up our character. The first step in this process is gonna be deciding on a race. Our default pick out of any race is definitely gonna be Night Elf, which has consistently provided us with the most benefits for quite a long time now, granting us the iconic racial shadow meld that has so many uses in PvP combat. Now, the most notable of which includes using this as another way of entering stealth, primarily to receive another rake stun without having to go for a reset. But in cases where you wanna optimize its effects, you can also immune some incoming projectiles or damage including Chaos Bolt, Storm Bolt, and Mortal Coil, or you can negate in-cast cast CC like Kidney Shot for a considerable advantage in almost any matchup. Now, focusing on the Horde races, if you want an alternative that makes you look absolutely based, look at picking Torrid. But do be warned here as this is massively weaker than our Night Elf counterpart. By choosing this race, we receive War Stomp, for an additional AoE stun that has a two second duration. This could help you initiate some CC chains, which is commonly followed by Cyclone, or to use a follow-up stun on your preferred target to potentially execute them. So with race out of the way, let's take a look at what's shaping up to be your best in-slot gear for season one. But first, before we do that, since you're likely gonna be finding upgrades along the way, let's discuss stat priority. Our main focus should be on mastery. The more we have on this stat, the more damage we can deliver from our bleeds and our finishers, enhancing your cleave and your burst damage mainly with Feral Frenzy and Ferocious Bite. Beyond this stat, we need to incorporate a good amount of versatility, up to 25%. Now this stat is pretty much a no-brainer here. We get targeted almost every single game and it's an excellent stat for PvP overall. Then we want to include a balance of both Critical Strike and Haste, with Crit favored just a bit more than the latter. Crit has become more potent to optimize our damage as it makes our combo point generation easier with Primal Fury and it synergizes wonders with our tier set to buff Primal Wrath, Ferocious Bite, or Rampant Ferocity, up to around 23% additional damage when one of our combo point generator spells crits. Haste, on the other hand, is still valuable as this stat makes our globals feel a little bit more fluid while increasing our energy regeneration and bleed ticks. However, what makes this stat worthwhile is that it reduces our cast time on spells, and if we apply a decent amount to our character, we can land Cyclones off some short-lasting stuns without any gaps. Over the next few weeks, you should look to collect your PvP scaled force set, with the exception of the helmet, which should be Algari crafted with versatility and mastery. 
For every slot that we can, we want to be crafting with verse and mastery, but if you're worried about your survivability, just opt for some conquest pieces instead, which includes our helmet and off pieces, and even applies to our jewelry too, where we need at least one crafted ring with mastery and versatility. Our weapon is also going to be crafted, but here you could definitely use a conquest weapon too. And for our trinkets, we're going to use the insignia and medallion, of course. Now let's get everything enchanted. For your cloak, you're going to want Chant of Burrowing Rapidity. For your chest, Storm Rider's Agility. Bracers, Chant of Armored Speed. Legs, Stormbound Armor Kit. Boots, Scout's March, or Plains Runner's Breeze. And then for your rings, grab Radiant Mastery for both. Finally, the last enchant is for your weapon, where we suggest getting Authority of Radiant Power. So due to the addition of the Vicious Jeweler's setting, you're now going to be able to add gems to your helmet, amulet, rings, belt, and bracers. Now one of these can be one of three unique PvP-specific gems, to which the Cognitive Bloodstone suits the best, as it allows you to become immune to any CC and interrupts if you end up juking interrupts, especially if you want to throw out some Cyclones. For the rest of your gym slots, the Versatile Onyx provides the best overall boost to your favorite stats. Finally, for your embellishments, we recommend picking up Elemental Focusing Lens as it deals the most consistent damage we can get out of any embellishment. Make sure you have at least one gym equipped though, or else it won't deal damage to the target that you're hitting. So finally, let's wrap things up with a look at some must-have macros for Feral. First, we suggest having focus macros for all your important crowd control, enabling you to CC off targets without the need to deselect your current target. So that's Cyclone, Entangling Roots, Mass Entanglement, Maim, Wild Charge, and Mighty Bash. Another method of crowd control involves using Arena 1, 2, and 3 macros, allowing you to apply CC or land interrupt on enemy players regardless of who you target. And even though these macros produce a similar effect to our focus macros previously mentioned, Arena macros are a bit more difficult getting used to, meaning that you want to jump into these once you feel almost like a natural at using focus macros, allowing you to optimize your gameplay. Another way you can streamline your rotation revolves around using Party 1 and Party 2 macros. Now, if you're unfamiliar with these, Party 1 refers to the person at the top of your party frames, and Party 2 is the second person. The basic way of doing this is what you see on screen now, where you'll need two macros for each ability, exactly like the example you can see on screen now. The most important abilities to have these four are being Wild Charge, Remove Corruption, and Regrowth. You could also do this for Thorns if you end up selecting it as a PvP talent. If you're likely familiar with the awkwardness of clicking to aim Ursal's Vortex, you may want to pick up this macro featured on the screen now. This macro removes the reticle entirely and instead casts Ursal's Vortex at the current cursor location, making it feel a bit smoother and efficient during times where you're kiting away or you want to keep uptime on your preferred target. Now we have a macro that's a little bit more exclusive to Druid itself, and that is Power Shifting. Upon using this macro, you can shift out of any form without having to wait for the global cooldown. And if you use Tiger's Fury afterwards, you can immediately shift back into cat form off global. This by itself maximizes our uptime on our targets without having to wait a few seconds to escape roots or to remove snares. And for our last macro here, this offers a nice quality of life improvement by grouping together all on-demand healing abilities. This makes it easier to recover from danger without having to click on a separate bind in order to use Health Stone. And remember this, Skill Capped is the only service that guarantees you'll climb at least 400 rating. Now we make this promise because Skill Capped really does work, and if it doesn't work for you, you shouldn't pay. Think of it like a gym membership that guarantees you'll get ripped. Crazy, right? So get started today by clicking on the link in the description. As always, though, we want to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you soon.